<clears throat> Today's Mass is that of Saint Sylvester, the Pope, but today I want to preach to you about another saint who holds the same feast day. And really, it's sort of a family of saintly people. But the saint who is canonized and given to us on this day is Saint Melania the Younger. But in order to understand Melania's life, the, young, the Younger, we have to first begin with Melania the Older, who was her grandmother. Melania was a daughter of a, of a, of a Roman praetor and comes from this illustrious Spanish um, family. When she married, she married into an extraordinarily high office and her husband only increased her power and influence that she had on society. As they went along, they had three children, two of which, though, died in their infancy and leaving only a son, uh, Publicola, who was, um, the, the was remained and, and lived after that. But as a young lady, about 24 years old, her husband, he too, suddenly died, leaving her a widow. Being that she had a large amount of means and she was extraordinarily pious, she left her son to be raised by, uh, by, uh, by people whom she hired and entrusted to, to him too. And she herself embraced a, a, a religious life for herself from that point forward, vowing never to, to marry again. And in fact, what had taken place near that time was that St. Athanasius died. And with that, there became this whole new persecution of Catholics by the Arians at that time, especially in the areas of Egypt and, and, and such. And so Melania, realizing she had extraordinary amount of means and no for no more home life to take care of. She put all of her focus and all of that effort towards taking care of the needy, not only those with hospitals and the poor and the rest, but most especially those who were sent into exile by the Arians. <clears throat> there were, and it says that um, she regularly would give to feed them, in, I mean, including that she would feed in a time frame of three days, over 5,000 people who were sent uh, into exile all by herself, and that uh, uh, many of these were, were priests and hermits and, and even bishops as well, and that in order to get them food, cause, because they were present, prevented oftentimes being imprisoned, um, she would disguise herself as a slave, and she would go and sneak into the prisons to bring them food and to bring them the various points of their need. And at one point in time, she was there, and the 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 guard of the t of the of the prison, he himself had no uh, no stake in trying to defend the Aryans in their pr imprisonment, but he felt very much trapped in the way of his duty towards uh, his higher ups. And so she came to him one time, and she didn't disguise herself this time, she came as, uh, as exactly who she was. And she looked at him and with the full confidence told him that I am the daughter of a council, I have been a wife of a man illustrious in his generation, and now I am the servant of Christ. Despise me not because of my means of dress, for I can attain a higher rank if I will, and I have sufficient credit to keep me from fearing you and to hinder you from touching my goods. But lest you should do wrong by ignorance, I have thought it fit to let you know exactly who I am. So basically, she came and told him, you know, don't touch me, don't bother me, I'm more important than you, let me through the door. And sure enough, the guard said, okay, that's what exactly I'll do. And she was allowed to come in and out freely from that point forward and f take care of those who were suffering as exiles and imprisonment from the, the Aryan, um, uh, from the Aryan uh, clergy. 
she would continue to go on and start founding monasteries and various other religious locations until finally it came to a point that her son, Publicola, he had grown up and married himself, finding a wife named Albina. And they began a family of their own, having, uh, and Albina came from a very important family and a very wealthy family as well and the because of that the wealth of the of Publicola only increased and Albina uh, being his wife they had a daughter whom they named Melania after the grandmother and with that the um, Melania she herself was given an early age to marriage as well to another who was uh, uh, named Pinianius, who was also of extraordinary means and influence. And so you had this whole entire family of people who had their wealth only increased by their marriages, but their piety surpassed even their wealth. And in time, Albina and Publicola and uh, Pinianus and Melania the Younger, they too agreed that they would no longer live as a married couple, but they would, uh, too, embrace religious life and use their goods to uh, to um, take care of the needy and to do acts of charity. For Ma the younger Melania's sake, she and her husband sold their estates in Rome, Italy, Aquitaine, Spain, and Britain to produce a sum of money which was greater than anybody in the entire empire had saved the emperor himself and yet they still had more um, property that they could have sold but it was there to be held until um, to, until certain until Melania was alone um, uh, and no longer and um, no longer when her husband died essentially and so they had to hold on to those estates but they immediately used these properties for good and Pianius, in fact, at one point in time, in need of some money to, to, to take care of more uh, of, the, of those who had been uh, refugeed, he looked to sell his uh, estate in Rome, which was so worth so much money that he couldn't sell it right away. In fact, the only way he was able to sell off the property was he had to wait until the Goths came and invaded and plundered and destroyed parts of his house until it was diminishing the price of it enough that somebody could actually afford to buy it. And at that point, he did just that. He sold it off. And eventually, they ended up in Hippo being taken uh, with St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine promised the husband of Melania that he wouldn't ordain him a priest. The, both husbands of um, Albina and Melania the Younger, they wanted, they, all they wanted to do, instead of embracing their high state of life, they wanted to do menial work and hard work in that, uh, that was becoming of someone just serving Christ. In fact, a lot of times it was said that they preferred to work in the cabbage fields, digging up the, the earth and planting and harvesting, rather than, than to rely on the, that being done by servants, whom it normally was. But at, the, at his arrival in, in Hippo, many of the people started to stir. They realized that uh, uh, that Pianius was very pious and intelligent, and he had lots of money to give to the poor. And they thought he would be the perfect priest to take care of the needy in Hippo. And they started to talk about this. Pianius made St. Augustine promise that he wouldn't ordain him. And St. Augustine told him that, that he had no intention to ordain him at, at that time. But the noise from the people grew louder and louder to the point, finally, St. Augustine said, all right, if this is what you really want is to have him as priest, I will see about ordaining him. At which point, Albina wrote to him a nasty, scathing letter, only as one saint could write to another saint, in which she rebuked him and told him that, that the people of Hippo, all they want is his money. They don't want him actually as a spiritual leader. St. Augustine, for his part, he deflated down Albina and told her, no, 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 no. 
the people want good, but I understand your concerns. And in the end, he continued to, he stayed with his promise and did not ordain Pianus. They eventually got in touch with St. Jerome, moved to Jerusalem, and finally, um, Melania the Younger was given uh, a cave there on the Mount of Olives with St. Jerome as her spiritual uh, father, and she stayed there in complete hermitage, only visited once every five days by her immediate family who would come to see that she had her basic necessities of food and water and things like that. And after a number of years, and all of those who were related to her finally dying before her, she went and returned, left there, um, and went on a couple of pilgrimages, finally returning back to, to Jerusalem, where she built a monastery and eventually died on this day. And so it is a perfect example, these uh, holy women and their, their holy husbands by extension as well, that we see just how much influence and good a good Catholic family life can have, one inspiring another, one causing another to be to, to strive after higher points of holiness, greater increases in charity, to work further towards greater goals of serving God. Man is, by nature, a societal being. We want to be around other people, and we sacrifice to make sure at times we get that quiet time alone, as always we do. But if those who are nearest to us, our family, uh, help us in creating that good Catholic atmosphere in our home, then think of how much greater we succeed in our own spiritual life and our own work towards, towards serving God because it is no longer just us relying on ourselves but we working together as a team, as a family to achieve that common goal, lifting each other up. And moreover, by extension from that, some do not have Catholic homes in which they live in but, but tread that path on their own. And you coming here, remind yourselves of that. You are their Catholic family. You have the opportunity to encourage and, and, can, and inspire those around you here as well. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.